Okay, these coordinate transformations are often easiest to see through example. Let's consider a P21221 crystal, and we're building this up uh, of molecules that contain chromophores that are planar, and we're going to map the symmetry relationships of the P2121 crystal to find out what tensor elements are present to the symmetry relationships of the, of, the, of the chromophore to find out which ones are present, and then determine the orientational averages connecting the two to describe the nonlinear optical properties of the crystal in the crystal reference frame. So let's consider the P21221 crystal. First of all, what tensor elements are allowed in a crystal of P21221 symmetry? The 21 refers to 180 degree rotation along with a translation. And the translation is small relative to the wavelength of light. It's, at the, it's on the order of the lattice constant. Um, and so it's really that 180 degree rotation that we care about in terms of the optics. Um, and the 212121 corresponds to a rotation in translation about the x, y, and z coordinates. So in terms of point group operations, we can think of that 21 screw dislocation as being a, a C2 effectively about the x-axis with a C2 about the y and a C2 about the z. And those are the three symmetry operations that are present uh, in terms of the optics in a P21221 crystal. Um, how do these play out? Well, what does the C2x do? That takes x into x. Oops, what am I doing? Not negative x. It takes into x into x. Um, so we can think of that C2 operation is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, right? If I'm rotating a vector, that's the C2 operation applied to it. And that will take x into x, y into negative y, so we're rotating a, um, 100, 180 degrees about the z-axis, and then z goes into negative z. The C2 for y will take x into negative x, y into y, and z into negative z, and then finally this last one about z will take x into negative x, y into negative y, and z into z. And if you ask yourself what combinations of, of three tensor elements, x, y, and z, will result in positive sign for every one of these symmetry operations, it turns out that you can convince yourself quite easily, and we won't go through the details here, that there's only six. And those are x, y, z, chi, x, z, y, chi, y, x, z, chi, y, z, x, and chi, z, x, y, chi, z, y, x. So those are the set that survive that collective set of symmetry operations. Now we've done this um, empirically based on, uh, on these uh, known simple transformations, but you can also, if you want to formalize it for any arbitrary symmetry operation, there's also a more, a more rigorous way to come up with this uh, rather than uh, by trial and error and inspection. Uh, and that is going back to the actual symmetry operations themselves. If I look at C2x as being 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, and I want to ask if I've got some chi local and I want to rotate it into this new reference frame, how do I generate that given an initial chi local? Well, we can do it just like we did rotation matrices, but now applied to the symmetry operations by using the vectorized uh, tensor. So we start out some initial, we'll indicate 0, um, and ask what happens with the uh, with the, um, the symmetrized. If I apply the symmetry operations, what do I get for my new set of tensor elements? We can apply it by considering the Kronecker product here as well. And I'm going to write this as a big 27 by 27 indicated by the bold times chi local prime gives the chi local after applying that symmetry operation. Now we've got all three symmetry operations plus the thing sitting there without doing anything. And so if we look at, if we apply the full set of symmetry operations and ask what survives that collective combination, it's going to be, um, it's going to be everything that is unaffected by application of all of these symmetry operations. And so the thing that survives is really going to be given by the summation of all of those. So this is a 27 by 27 identity that just recovers your initial local frame plus the C2x 
That's another, now again, the triple chronicler product is supposed to be represent is meant to be represented there. And if I populate all of these and multiply them out, I'll get a set of 27 numbers here. And it, it will turn out that only six of those 27 numbers will be non-zero. And those six non-zero elements will be exactly those that we generated by induction just by looking at the symmetry operations and their effect on the tensor elements. So we have um, a couple of different ways of handling what's going on in the, uh, in the crystal tensor. How do we then approach the, the, mo the molecular response? Well, let's, let's consider uh, in particular, let's, let's assume a couple of things. First of all, we have a pointer chromophore. And that we have that core, that chromophore is of C two V symmetry, and that the transition that, that there's one dominant transition that's giving rise to the nonlinear optical response, and that dominant transition has A one symmetry. So how do we use this information? Well, we can take advantage of the fact that we know that beta I J K, if we're resonant at at the second harmonic. Uh, oops, that uh, looks like this. It's multiplied by mu i alpha j k, where alpha j k describes the two photon absorption matrix, and mu the transition moment. So we know a couple of things. That means that if we apply this, then the, the first index in beta for corresponding to i must be z. And so that corresponds to, um, and the second one for alpha j k um, can either be x, y, or z. Uh, now, for planar, then we can exclude y if we're defining the plane of the chromophore to be the xz plane. So this leaves just two non-zero elements in the molecular tensor. We get beta zzz and beta zxx. So now we have our groundwork laid out. We've got uh, the crystal tensor of chi xyz and all the rest of the chiral tensor elements. And then we've got the beta X, X, I'm sorry, Z, X, X, and Z, Z, Z. So now we'll go, let's go ahead and, and just map. Uh, we'll just consider one of these to illustrate the process, but you could du duplicate it for all the, others, uh, the other five tensor elements. We'll just consider X, Y, Z, and how each of these two maps onto that, given the rotation uh, matrix elements given to the right. So if we look at chi, X, YZ, and we'll consider first the ZXX contribution. Um, if we look at this, we've got, it'll be X onto Z, so that'll be XZ prime. I'm sorry, these should all have primes, so we can keep track of the bookkeeping a little bit more easily. So if we look at big X, little Z prime, that's going to give us a sine theta cosine phi. So this will be beta ZXX. And then the next one is yx, big Y, little x. Um, and that's going to be, I'll just move it down here to give myself a little bit more room. Um, sine, psi, cos phi, plus cos theta, cos psi, sine phi. And then finally, x to z, I'm oh, sorry, z to x will give us a negative sine theta cos phi. I mean. All right, so that is how beta ZXX contributes to chi XYZ. We also have the contributions from beta Z prime. Oh, man, not many of that one. Let's go beta. There we go. There should be primes on these as well. And now we've got X onto Z, Y onto Z, and Z onto Z. So X onto Z, that gives us sine theta cos phi. Um, y onto Z gives us sine theta sine phi. And then Z onto Z gives cos theta. All right, so that is the orientational average that connects the, the orientational, not, not an average, because this is a delta function orientation distribution. That's the beauty of a crystal. But we've got um, a, a mapping of the molecular response onto the crystal frame, and that allows us to predict the nonlinear optical properties of the crystal 
with knowledge of what's going on inside the molecular frame and the packing inside the lattice in terms of the orientational averages. 